Welcome, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss the six transportation areas of the 2020 report card for Maine's infrastructure. I am Dan Bushart, current president of the Maine section of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Here is an overview of today's presentation. First, we will get into what the report card is all about. Then we will dive deeper into the six transportation areas shown on the screen, and we will conclude with what steps we can take to improve the grade. Starting in 2008, the main section of ASE wrote our first infrastructure report card. After being asked by for former Congressman Mike Mishu, where is the state's report card? After the initial report card in 2008, the main section provides an updated comprehensive assessment every four years, which results in the report card on Maine's infrastructure. The maintenance and improvement of Maine's infrastructure is vital to our economy, health, safety, security, and the environment. Decisions about infrastructure the public uses, which we all pay for through user fees and taxes, as well as private investments needs to be made based on long-term comprehensive planning with sustainable and reliable funding sources. So what is the report card? The report card is created by a team of 30 plus civil engineers who volunteered hundreds of hours of their time. Civil engineers are the designers and maintainers of the concrete items that make us a modern society. We became civil engineers intending to change the world for the better. Our first canon is to hold paramount the safety, health, welfare of the public. And this report was written with that motto in mind. Our intent in producing the report card is to simplify the thousands of pages of publicly available data into a single report with a simple letter grade to provide a picture of how our infrastructure is doing. The report card can be used as a tool to communicate, educate the public and lawmakers on infrastructure, and promote questions about infrastructure. The report card grades are based on an A through F scale, similar to grade school. With the grading scale the report card is based on, it is not financially feasible for every category to be an A. We, we would be happy to be in the B range with additional attention turned to categories as they slipped to a C. Unfortunately, as we go through the categories, you'll see not all categories achieve this. Each category of the report card was graded on the above criteria. Let's take roadways as an example for each of the criteria. Capacity, do we have enough lanes to serve the traffic demand? Condition, potholes, cracking, and rutting are all examples of poor condition. Operation and maintenance, are we able to take care of what we have? Funding, is the current funding adequate for the identified needs? Future need, does the funding forecast match the anticipated needs? Public safety, can we all reach our destination safely? Resilience, are durable, stronger materials that stand up to Maine's winters being used? Innovation, are new materials, designs, or installation methods being used? Before we reveal the grades, it is important to say the report card is not meant to be a commentary on nor an evaluation of the performance of any particular department or agency. On the contrary, our teams found, in many cases, our government officials are doing exemplary work with the limited resources allotted to them. It should also be mentioned, the full effect of the COVID-19 pandemic is not fully understood at this point. The data presented in this report is pre-pandemic. All sectors of infrastructure have felt some effect from the pandemic, some more than others. Only time will tell on the full effect the pandemic will have on infrastructure. As mentioned before, this presentation is focusing on the six transportation areas. The other 10 infrastructure categories can be found at the website listed at the bottom of the slide, infrastructurereportcard.org backslash main. That being said, let's begin revealing the grades. We will first start with aviation. There is 69 public use airports in the state of Maine. Of these, 35 are part of the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems. This report focuses on the 35 airports, of which 
29 are general aviation and six are commercial service airports. The report found Maine's airports have made notable improvements since 2016, reaching a state of good condition and are poised to remain safe, reliable, and sufficient to serve the state's future needs. While the two largest airports, Portland International Jetport and Bangor International, have some minor capacity restraints, system-wide, Maine's airports do not have any notable air or landside shortfalls. The state's Airport Improvement Program, or AIP, has an average of 41% higher funding since 2017, resulting in more resources for significant pavement, safety, and capacity improvements. However, threatening a future fiscal gap is the $4.50 cap on the passenger facility charge, or better known as PFC, which must be eliminated to provide a more sustainable local source of funds for airport improvements. Maine's airports are, are innovating and embracing green initiatives more than ever to address compliance issues, reduce their environmental footprint, and increasingly as strategic components of the airport's long-term prosperity and success. The Portland International Jetport is producing the first recycled aircraft de-icing fluid certified for resale in the country. The Sanford Seacoast Regional Airport has broke ground on Maine's largest universal solar energy project, a 50 megawatt, 150,000 solar panel farm, which when completed is expected to be the most extensive solar array on an airport in the United States. Obstructions, primarily trees in the approach and departure surface protected airspace, continue to plague the state's airports, resulting in equipment malfunctions, such as increased instrument approach minimums and cancel nighttime procedures. However, in the past four years, the number of airports with night instrument restrictions has decreased by 31% from 16 airports to 11. Maine has also seen an increase in airports that have weather reporting systems and that offer full fuel service. Due to the addition of the state's newly upgraded fixed wing medical fleet, runway lengths of Maine's airports are being increased and continue to need to be increased. The longer runways increase capacity and allow some emergency service aircraft to fly approaches and land in more inclement weather scenarios. Maine ASE found airports that have a B grade, which is an increase from a C plus in 2016. Maine's highway system includes a total of 3,754 bridges, at least 10 feet in length. Of these bridges, 2,461 are greater than 20 feet in length. The bridges are owned by the Maine Department of Transportation, the Maine Turnpike Authority, and municipalities. The report found 58% of Maine's 3,754 bridges are more than 50 years old. That is nearly three in five bridges were constructed more than 50 years ago, with one in five constructed at least 80 years ago. Many of these bridges were designed to last 50 years before requiring significant repair or replacement. Historic funding levels have not been sufficient to replace bridges before they exceed their expected design life. And nearly one out of every seven main bridges or 13% is structurally deficient. While public support for transportation spending in Maine remains strong, achieving and sustaining long-term improvements requires a comprehensive strategy to address a nearly $68 million annual shortfall needed for Maine's bridges. The good news is Maine DOT's three-year work plan includes a continued emphasis on bridge maintenance and preservation projects. The number of structurally deficient bridges in Maine has been improving gradually over the past several years, as seen by the blue line on the graph above. While we have seen an improvement, Maine still has more work to do, as it has a greater percentage of structurally deficient bridges than both New England, the red line, and the United States, the green line, overall. There is hope, though. Recently, Maine was approved for about a $45 million grant through the National Infrastructure Grant Program, better known as BUILD, better utilizing investment to leverage development for transportation projects to replace and rehabilitate deteriorated bridges. Nearly 25 million of the 45 million 
will go towards the replacement of the 111-year-old Tyconic Bridge, which connects Waterville and Winslow. Maine's bridges have seen improvement over the past four years, but Maine ASCE found more improvement is needed to raise the grade. The grade remains at a C minus. Next, we will discuss ports. Maine has over 3,500 miles of coastline with 12 significant ports and harbors as shown above. Five of these ports, Portland, Searsport, Eastport, Bucksport, and Bangor, are well suited to handle the requirements of most modern cargo vessels. The report found Maine's ports are generally in good condition, with more than 108 million in state and federal funds invested over the last 12 years. Cruise ship calls throughout the state have been historically strong with year after year increases, but 2020 will see a downturn due to COVID-19. In order to stay current, Maine should update its three port strategy, which was last updated around 1980, to reflect recent investments and develop clear objectives for future uses and investments at each terminal. Maine has not yet fully leveraged the opportunities afforded by the M95 Marine Highway and short sea shipping. In 2010, the US DOT designated a marine highway route from Portland to New York and New Jersey. However, its full potential has not yet been realized due to lack of investment in a new articulated tug barge vessel, and also the reliability of a new service with customers on both ends of the route. Projected growth in freight traffic in the cruise ship industry will require an additional 110 million of necessary investments in areas of industrial infrastructure, intermodal connections, cruise ship terminals, and municipal facilities. A breakdown of these anticipated investments is shown on the slide. Main ASE found ports to maintain a B minus grade, but is trending towards a great increase with continued investment. Next, we'll discuss rail. In 2020, Maine has 1,296 miles of active railroad. Almost 320 miles of active rail are owned by the state. The remaining miles of track are owned by five private railroad companies. There is currently no capacity constraints by volume on railroads in Maine. And the largest customers in Maine are the pulp and paper and lumber industries. The report found recent federal grants have been leveraged with state and private funding to make noticeable improvements to Maine's railroads over the past four years. At the completion of the ongoing planned improvements, it is expected all railroad main lines in Maine will be able to support 286,000 pound railroad cars, the standard of class one railroads and a major modernization milestone. Also, a $20 million Tiger Grant aided in track updates that now allow for increased speed and reliability. However, one area of concern is the state-owned railroad track conditions that are rated good or fair remain at approximately 56%. Same as in 2016, continued investment is needed on mainline tracks to build upon current and past projects. Maine ACE found rail to have a C plus grade, an increase from a C in 2016. For more information about rail and recent rail projects in Northern Maine, be sure to check out Gordon Eddington's presentation, a look at freight rail improvements in Northern Maine. Maine's highway system is a critical transportation service and economic driver for the state's 1.3 million residents and 37.1 million annual visitors. Improved roads provide Maine's residents with greater mobility and traffic safety, which in turn improves personal and commercial productivity, tourism experiences, and serves as an economic development driver for the state. A total of 23,000 linear miles of roadway are managed by local, county, state, and federal jurisdictions. Maine DOT is tasked with managing approximately 8,350 miles, a 37% of these roadways more than twice the mileage of any other New England DOT. Even though Maine DOT manages more than twice the mileage of any other New England DOT, 
Maine receives the lowest federal funding per mile of the New England states. The report found the state's highway system has a projected $165 million annual funding gap before the drastic downturn in 2020, which will grow the need even more. Per a Maine state law passed in spring 2012 by the legislature, right-sized goals were established, including by 2022, improve all priority one and priority two corridors so that their safety, condition, and serviceability customer service levels equal fair or better. Due to Maine's continued funding shortfall, roads are not meeting the goals set in 2012. In 2019, 8% of priority one and two roads have poor or unacceptable ratings for condition, and 8% have poor or unacceptable ratings for safety. According to the Road Information Program, or better known as TRIP, Maine motorists spend an average of $543 per year in extra vehicle operating costs. Combined, Mainers spend at least an extra $1 billion per year in vehicle operating costs, congestion, and crashes, with the state producing the highest fatality rate in New England. However, the formation of the Blue Ribbon Commission in 2019 to study and recommend funding solutions for the state's transportation system and years of overwhelming voter support at the ballot box for transportation bond referendums points to an interest in finding sustainable funding solutions for Maine's roads. Maine DOT measures priority level one through four roads in three areas called customer service levels, condition, capacity, and public safety. As you can see from the graph above, Maine DOT has implemented programs and made improvement over both 2012 and 2016 in both condition and public safety categories. However, this slight improvement is not sustainable without substantial investments in our state's highway systems. Maine ASCE found roads maintained a degrade, but is trending towards a grade increase with continued investments. Maine has 23 transit systems that receive federal funding along with the state's ferry service and commuter, bicycle, and pedestrian programs. Transit ridership in Maine is primarily composed of non-commuters. Non-commuters are defined as those who are not using transit for work purposes, but rather tourism, shopping, medical appointments, or other reasons. The report found most areas in Maine do not have the population density to support typical transit services. But between 2013 and 2017, ridership in Southern Maine increased by 13%, or about half a million riders, counter to national trends. As Maine's population continues to age and to improve sustainability into the future, transportation options will become increasingly important. However, the state only provides 86 cents annually per capita as an operation subsidy for transit services, much less than any other New England state and 38th in the nation. According to a recent Astro survey, the median level of state support throughout the United States is $5.17 per capita. In 2019, underfunding resulted in the fleet of 436 transit vehicles that have only 36 percent classified in good condition, with more than 50 percent classified as in fair or poor condition. Maine ASCE found transit maintain a D plus grade. In conclusion, Maine's transportation categories are headed in the right direction, with five out of the six categories trending upwards and two of the six receiving a great increase from 2016. We need to keep our foot on the gas pedal, however, to keep this trend moving forward. Increased investment is needed for all of Maine's transportation infrastructure to keep raising the grade. Maine ASCE has identified five steps to help raise the grade. Number one, know what you have. To extend the lifespan of existing assets and reduce the unexpected full replacement cost of infrastructure, asset management data and strategic long-term planning should be implemented across infrastructure portfolios. Furthermore, routine condition assessments, life cycle cost analysis, and prioritized asset management data should be streamlined into normal infrastructure operations 
should judiciously steward limited resources by balancing capital costs with long-term operation and maintenance needs. Number two, know what you need. To make good decisions on infrastructure investment, asset management data needs to be understood and risks need to be assessed. Infrastructure risks to be evaluated include cost, safety, functionality, environmental damage, and limited opportunity for growth. Performance measures should be established, routinely measured, and periodically reevaluated to assess progress. Through the design and construction process, materials, techniques, and emerging delivery methods should be implemented to create innovative and resilient infrastructure, which can adapt to our ever-changing world. Number three, know what it costs. Many infrastructure owners can determine their own needs and set user fees or bonding plans, but a sustained educational effort should be made to inform users of fee changes and to instruct smaller and of resource limited utilities on financing and approaches to public outreach. The public's willingness to finance new or upgraded infrastructure through changes to the user fees is critical, especially when significant investments is needed. User fees should reflect the true cost of using, maintaining, and improving infrastructure. Make the investment. Smart infrastructure investments should be made on a consistent and strategic foundation based on long-term planning and prioritization. Leaders from all levels need to come together to create consistent, dedicated funding from a variety of sources to allow infrastructure owners to plan their investments. Investments should be made in research and development to promote innovation. Thinking outside the box can result in cost-effective, sustainable infrastructure with an increased lifespan and decreased maintenance and or recovery cost. Number five, keep learning and adapting. State and federal regulations, agency policies, and design standards should be continually reviewed, updated, and synthesized to keep current with the ever-changing world remove design construction redundancy, increase agency effectiveness, or create additional funding mechanisms for agencies. To find the full report, go to infrastructurereportcard.org backslash main. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to email us at reportcard at ase.org. Thank you all for taking the time to view this presentation today. I'd like to close by saying in order to continuously improve our state's economy and create good paying jobs, we must continue to invest in infrastructure. Infrastructure must remain a priority to promote the health, safety, security, and the environment of the state we all proudly call our home. It will take all of us speaking with our friends, neighbors, and elected officials about the importance of infrastructure and the required investment in infrastructure to help raise the grade and create a better life for all. Thank you.